All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I know our speaker is here and we have a good audience, so we'll get things started. Hi, my name is Jim Gow. I'm the host of the Grit City Think and Drink. I'm a professor at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Uh, coming to you for today from uh, Michigan, three time zones away. So um, it's a true late night event over here. Uh, hope you all are doing well and thanks for coming in tonight. I'll give you a little bit of background on the Grit City Think and Drink, then we'll introduce our speaker. Julian will give the most amazing talk you've ever heard. Uh, we'll give away some prizes uh, and then we'll tell you how to actually get those prizes to you. And then you'll get a chance to stump the speaker uh, at the end to ask your questions. So uh, the Grit City Thick and Drink happens every uh, second Tuesday of the month. If you haven't been with us before, we hope you'll join us again. The uh, website is actually down below. You can find all the future talks there. You can also, if you missed any, you can find the recordings of those talks uh, all available there as well. So you can check that out for upcoming and past events in case you wanna catch something you missed. Um, uh, for purposes of uh, safety purposes, we are unfortunately having to uh, mute you and not allowing you to share your video just so you know, but you can ask questions later on uh, and answer uh, those uh, questions to get prizes by chatting. Uh, if you're in chat function, if you haven't done this by now in Zoom, you can go to the bottom of your screen and find the chat box and then you'll be chatting with me and I will field the questions and feed them to Julian, just so you know. Uh, so uh, uh, you, as you know already our talk today, um, Julian will give that uh, talk about what he's speaking on later on, uh, but we have an upcoming talk uh, in our, our April talk is from Dr. Jenny J, who's down at, the, at UCLA. She's gonna talk about uh, stand up for the earth while you sit down to dinner. So she's gonna talk about the combination of uh, basically your food footprint or, garbo or uh, global your, uh, carbon footprint of your meal, as well as other sustainability topics related to how you eat. So hope you will uh, check that out in April. Uh, and we have the entire uh, year of 2021 booked out at this point. So uh, stick around for all the cool talks that'll be coming your way. Um, so glad to have you here. And uh, without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and let Julian get his going. And in the meantime, I will introduce our speaker. Julian Olden is professor in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, University of Washington. Uh, he broadly motivated by the, uh, a future where people recognize and respect the diverse values provided by functioning freshwater ecosystems. Julian seeks to integrate science-based approaches with on the ground management and conservation decisions. Uh, as an addition to what he wrote, it turns out Julian was also recognized by Web of Science as one of 2020's highly cited researchers, uh, which is means he does a lot of really cool things and people actually read his stuff. So uh, without further ado, Julian, it is all yours. Awesome, Jim, thanks. Hope I'm coming through tonight loud and clear. Um, yeah, thanks for this opportunity, Jim. I think, you know, uh, I was really excited. I think Jim suggested this idea to me a couple years ago, if I recall correctly. And um, I was like, wow, beer and talking science, two of my favorite pastimes. Um, but at one time, I think he promised me a pint of beer in exchange. And I think this is a real bait and switch, sorry the pun, um, in terms of talking with you. But anyways, um, cheers everyone and hope you're all drinking and enjoying this from abroad. I'm going to be talking a little bit about actually work which originated in a pub. Um, like all good science, we like to talk about science in our scientific meetings, but we often um, socialize at night. And some of the great ideas usually come out during over a pint of beer. And that is what happened with myself and some colleagues from different places of the world. Started to talk a little bit about what inspires us about fish and what um, kind of motivates us to continue studying the diverse ways in which uh, fish kind of contribute to society. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here. This Grid City Think and Drink is just a really fun thing. And, you know, today we're going to talk about fish um, shown on the left there, um, and then hopefully enjoy some beer as well. And by the middle of this talk, I'm going to show you how these two things are actually quite related. 
the fish on the left and the beer on the right. And in fact, many of you uh, unknowingly are um, right now enjoying one of the side benefits um, that fish have to offer. We will leave that in a while. Because you know what? When we talk about fish, we typically talk about things like this. We talk about um, how global fish production around the world has increased through time. Here I'm showing you wild captured fisheries from freshwaters and oceans and aquaculture. Um, and this is just increasing through time. We have a huge dependence on fish. You know, in fact, um, the latest estimates um, show that global fish production is around 180 million tons per year valued um, at around, for first sale value, at around uh, 400 billion US dollars. Uh, so the vast majority of this is used for consumption, about 80% or so. And the, the remaining 20% is actually used mainly for what we call non-food uses, but that's really to produce fish meal, which is still ends up as food, or fish oil, which is a health-related topic. The reality is, is that fish provide many great services to us. So beyond food and on our plate, uh, fish are actually the most biodiverse vertebrate group on this planet. They serve a lot of different vital roles. We know all about them because of the recreational opportunities that they provide. I'm, I'm an angler and, and enjoy hooking a fish on the end of a line. Uh, we often admire them and have them as pets in aquaria. Um, and also they provide a lot of good uh, ecosystem functions. And we're all keenly aware of some of the functions that Pacific salmon here provide us. So these are really like intrinsic or uh, kind of ecological or social economic values of fish. And these are super well recognized. What's also very well recognized is that fish have tremendous cultural and educational importance in human societies. So these include longstanding representation in many religious ceremonies. They're referenced in folklore, mythology, um, and also just prominently displayed in, um, in artifacts. Fish similarly are widely recognized in film. I think I've seen Finding Nemo one too many times uh, because of my 12 year old daughter. Um, they're in, uh, in recognized in, in music. They inspire literature. Um, and they are often represented in theater. Of course, pop culture is also a really big place in which they're recognized as well. This is a little throwback for all of you Monty Python fans. The Flying Circus shown here. This is a great example of John Cleese getting slapped in the face by small fish. A reminder of things that we don't like to happen and then often gets ultimate payback in classic Monty Python-like humor as he's consumed by a Nazi fish. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, my point that people, you know, recognize these diverse values of fish, but they rarely think about fish other than a source of protein, a pet, maybe a recreational prize or a basis for inspiration or worship. My point is that fish are much less well recognized in the diversity of other ways in which they contribute to human societies. And it was these diverse perspectives that first uh, let me and some of my friends just start to think about, you know, just, just how are they used in these other non-food related ways, non-health related ways. And this resulted in this really fun paper, which I'm going to be talking to you about today, in which we try to explore some of these things. So today, as a group, we're going to be talking and exploring the assorted uses of freshwater marine fishes, looking past food and other kind of um, uh, human values and focusing particularly on both the present and peering in the past, the ways in which they contributed to things like manufacturing and industry, uh, how they've inspired technology. Um, they're used in, that, used in the healthcare sector, use as used as tools and weapons, even apparel and jewelry, musical instruments, and then we'll finish off with souvenirs and attractions. So I don't know about you, but when I look at a fish, I see a, I see a whole variety of things here. I, I just don't see the flesh in which we eat and the rest is thrown away. I see just a really beautiful anatomy, an anatomy which is kind of filled with this diversity of different things 
And human societies through time have kind of recognized that all of these different things provide um, ways in which uh, we can benefit them from them in human society, ways in which we can look at it, the form and function of these, of these parts to inspire the way in which we do things differently, say in technology or in the medical fields. So today we're gonna go for a little tour. We're gonna kind of just skim around the body of the fish here, focusing in on things like bones and skin and scales. Look at swim bladders and intestines, like the gory parts of them, which we tend to just discard. Um, and then the whole fish and, and talk a little bit about, talk about how society have used these different parts in a whole variety of different ways. So let's, let's start with bones, you know, bones, kind of the stellical structure, you know, gives, reinforces the body of, of all vertebrates, including fish. And, you know, one of the earliest, you know, one of the most interesting earliest use of bones was uh, bones being ground, ground up and used by the early Chinese um, in toothpaste. It pr provides an abrasion and also helps remineralize teeth and restore enamel, apparently. And, and, and it is still used now um, in this way. It's a real interesting way. So this is kind of fine powder and grinding up of bones. Glue, fish glue is actually an adhesive. It's, it's created by bo boiling up um, fish bones as well as other connected tissues. Um, and mainly uh, kind of it is formed through hydrologists of the, um, of the collagen. Fish glue is a really interesting thing. It's still used now, but way back in the third uh, century, uh, where in Greek mythology, Hippolytus first noted it's used by magicians and diviners on the streets of Rome. Um, according to Greek mythology, glue, uh, fish glue was like asbestos-like properties and tricksters, uh, quote, would uh, join his feet with fish glue so that he can walk over hot coal, coals without being burned. Um, later, fish glue was used by the Greeks and the Romans they developed it for veneering, specifically for like wood bonding uh, during the uh, medieval ages. Um, fish glues were also used as a source for painting and illuminating manuscripts. Um, today, uh, fish glues are kind of rare, not, not as used in the industry as much, but they're still used, especially for uh, making or storing artifacts. So they still serve a very important role. Also, in virtually all continents, there's musical instruments which are made in part from fish glue um, derived from fish. Um, so this is a traditional Brazilian plucking instrument used in the Pantanal region of Brazil, and it's made and embellished with fish glue. Um, so also its strings are also derived from various fish parts. Um, it's popular in local communities among fishermen. So this is just one of one of a few different uses of bones uh, from fish. Let's continue on our journey. Let's take a look at the, the, the swim bladder. So the swim bladder shown right here is uh, give buoyancy to fish, right? It's, it increases with air or decreases to provide neutral buoyancies for fish. So fish doesn't have to constantly swim to maintain its vertical position in the water column. Well. Swim bladders have been used for a variety of different things. Isinglass, it's a, it's a derivative um, from a Greek word for a sturgeon bladder. It's, a, the, the, it's kind of a transparent um, kind of pure gelatin uh, material. It's prepared from swim bladder, sturgeon, and also other fish now. Um, they're, they're detached from the body. That's what's shown right here. Um, they're dried, they're cut into thin strips as shown in the upper right right here. Um, they're made out of about 80% collagen. They're dissolved in hot water, they're diluted, they're cooled, and they can be used for a whole variety of things, including uh, fining agents during alcohol processing. Um, so specifically, isinglass has been used commercially to clarify wines and beers. Um, it provides a way to kind of cause yeast to precipitate out of suspension, leaving beer clean. So um, the use of isinglass is kind of decreased a little bit with a uh, modern brewing technology because of centrifuge, but as recently of 2017, um, trace amounts were still found in every pint of Guinness. And actually craft 
beer makers still use ice and glass for the, during the fermentation process. So uh, many of you might actually be drinking a beer right now and lo and behold, you're, there's actually fish juices in there. So something nice to think about. Um, ice and glass was also used as a food preservative during the Second World War in Britain. Uh, they dissolved it into water and it was an effective uh, preservative for fresh eggs. It would cover fresh eggs. Another really interesting use of swim bladders um, was during the English Civil War. Uh, condoms were actually made out from swim bladders of fish. And these condoms were uh, deployed to the army to reduce the transmission of syphilis. So what I've shown right here is a, uh, unfortunately, I apologize, um, 110 year old condom. Um, these condoms were actually meant to be reusable. Uh, that's indicated in the, the zoom in here where the former owners carefully tallied scribe here in terms of how many times each condom was used. Ironically, uh, the swim bladder of some fish, including the weak fish, are actually used in traditional medicine in many Asian countries and are considered an aphrodisiac. Um, so I think this is quite funny in the sense that um, condoms might uh, that can be used as an aphrodisiac, which might then promote the, uh, the use of swim bladders in different ways. I don't know what came first, but either way, they both work in transition. Scales are really another interesting thing. Scales of, of fish have been used in a whole variety of ways. Some interesting uh, current uses of fish scales are used as a natural absorbent for the treatment of organic pollution. So it's used to remove uh, certain pollutants from wastewater um, in the seafood industry. It also is a biofilm colonization material uh, uh, media. Uh, so it allows uh, bed bioreactors to kind of treat effluent from dairy farms. Uh, scales are also used in, um, ground up scales are used in cosmetics. So this uh, crystalline, Guanine is a kind of extracted from cosmetics and um, it's basically used in a whole variety of things from nail polish to lipstick to shampoo and other things because it gives that shimmering effect that you can see right here. That effect, that shimmering coming from the ground up scales. And increasingly uh, melted down scales are being used as bioplastics. So here's a great example of a biodegradable um, plastic, which can be used in packaging of different manufacturing goods. And this has been created 100% um, down by the kind of the grinding and then melting down um, of fish scales. And then in high kind of fashion, they've also been kind of melded uh, into um, uh, glasses as shown here. So if we kind of continue along the fish, we can spend a little bit of time looking at uh, fish skin. Uh, so fish skin has been used in, in uh, you know, it obviously is a big byproduct of uh, fishing, whether commercial or recreation, and it's been used in a, in a whole variety of ways. Historically, uh, chagrin is a, is a type of rawhide. Naturally, it's a, it's a, it's a, enough, it's a rough, untanning skin. Historically, it's derived from a horse chagrin, um, but in the 17th and early 18th century, um, it began to be used to apply to leather made from the skin of sharks, skin rays, as well as other fish. Um, and now it's produced commercially in farmed Asian stingrays. So picture here is actually a, a salmon skin coat used in the Amar region of uh, Siberia in the 1800s. Um, in modern times, chagrin is used um, as a fancy leather for uh, book bindings, uh, pocketbooks, um, hilts right here, or swords. Um, it has a really good reputation because it can withstand rough handling. It has kind of a fine coarse-like structure which allows you to hang on to it. And it's naturally water resistant. Um, in fact, that kind of rough um, properties of skin, shark skin in particular, has now been used um, as a sandpaper um, as well. Skin also has done a whole variety of things um, in terms of um, um, inspiration. So electric eel skin has uh, inspired the development of like super stretchable nano generators. 
Um, these are things that you kind of, uh, you can wear, so they're deformable and they're wearable power sources. So they produce electricity um, by touch or tapping. So there's been a lot of really interest in doing this for gloves, also for athletes to use them to generate electricity. Um, also what people are doing kind of extreme outdoor adventures, they can actually recharge small batteries by kind of wearing these nano, wearable nano generators. And that was inspired uh, by um, the electric eel skin. Um, other interesting uh, uses have been uh, use skin as an aquacollagen. Um, so uh, skin derived from salmon, uh, minnows, and now uh, uh, cichlids have been promoted as scaffolding for kind of engineering of uh, bone and other issues, surgical dressings. Um, so recently skin from tilapia shown here has been suggested as a possible biological cover or a dressing for wound burns in both humans and animals. Um, so tilapia skin is inexpensive and it's an effective option to treat patients with second and third degree burns because it contains a large amount of moisture and type one collagen proteins, which are at levels comparable to human skin. So this prevents scarring while promoting healing of wounds. Um, it eliminates the need to remove and redress um, over multiple times. Um, and these dressings can be on people on the order of months and then peel off very easily uh, to help uh, recovering from burn. And it's also been used on small children such as shown right here. So it's a real interesting example of using fish skin as um, currently as wound dressing. Let's continue on our journey. I'm gonna kind of throw all these together here, talk a little bit about um, how fish fins, eyes, and onlus have been used in a variety of ways. So fins have been, uh, uh, fin and fin spikes have been used in a variety of ways uh, in jewelry. So the invasive lionfish, uh, which is kind of throughout tropical and subtropical regions of the world, the fin rays have been fashioned into earrings and necklaces as shown right here. Fish eyes actually have been used in some pieces of jewelry. So these are eyes from the black snapper. So this is caught by local fishermen and the eyes can be boiled, cured, and then dyed to create pieces of jewelry like shown here. And finally, um, otoliths. Otoliths are the um, uh, uh, ear bones of fish. So they're the, in, the inner ear of fish. It's a small calcium carbonate structure, very small like the size of a rice or bigger as shown here. Uh, otoliths um, in the ear bone per, are multiple functions in fish. It helps them maintain equilibrium. It gives them a sense of depth um, and, and as well as acoustic perception as they're moving around water bodies. And what's really interesting is that otoliths, the ear bones are actually the densest elements in a fish, which means that after fish die and decompose, the only thing that you're gonna see left is a washing up of otoliths. And in fact, that's what uh, first people started noticing them. In the Great Lakes, the otoliths of freshwater drum were found washed up on the beaches. And they were believed to be uh, lucky stones. They're termed lucky charms or lucky stones because whoever would find them amongst the rocks would be provided good fortune and charms to ward off illness in some cultures. So although some people thought they were just pebbles at once, now they're actually revered and looked for. Apparently there's a tradition among Great Lake uh, fishermen and sailors of keeping these otoliths a lucky charms. It keeps them safe from storms. And apparently it gives them the edge up in any local card games as well. Well, these otoliths, in addition to just being lucky charms shown on the right, have also been fashioned into jewelry. So these are some examples of uh, some external structures as well as internal otoliths that have been used by fish. All right, let's get a little bit gory, if you will, and get right into the connective tissues in the liver of fish, and how have they been used in a variety of ways? Well, they have been used as a source of biofuel, including in a wide variety of plants. Uh, uh, so the, the issue is that, you know, there's a huge amount of waste that comes from both uh, commercial fisheries, and there's been people looking into how we they can use that and process fish waste through heating, to release the oil from fat deposits and then separate them, those liquids from solids 
through centrifuging. And what ends up at the end of the chain is oil cleaned and purified. You have to add a catalyst and then you have biofuel. So in one example, um, a study used um, fish waste oil as a transportation diesel fuel. And there's been a lot of interest now with partnering between the fishing industry, which produces a huge amount of fish waste um, and industry to produce uh, biofuels. It's growing, although um, admittedly, it's still um, very small scale operations, such as the one I showed here in the bottom left, uh, which is in Mexico. Um, there's also been industrial uses of fish oils uh, rendered from a number of organs. Um, these oils are used on wood, metal, uh, fiber, um, all as ways as kind of lubricants, if you will. Um, one really great example of this is uh, the fish oils that come from ratfish, shown right here, this marine species. This is a really interesting species. About 60% of the total weight of this fish, so well over half, um, is its liver. That's its liver right there. It's, it's almost all liver. And this liver right here, about 80% of that um, wet weight um, has oil, is oil. So these large oily livers, they're, they're really a play important role in fish, again, for providing buoyancy at a very extreme depths. And that's where ratfish ex, um, exist at really extreme depths out in the ocean. Um, but that can be basically, oil can be extracted from that. There's some great photographs where you can just put that in water and wait overnight. And when you wake up, you'll just see pools of oil all in the water, which can then be separated. These oils have been used in a variety of different ways as lubricants. Um, that historically, they used to be used to lubricate guns and pocket watches and other fine instruments. Um, what was interesting is apparently NASA also considered using ratfish liver oil as a lubricant in their space program at one time. If we continue on our journey, uh, let's take a little bit of it, the tongue and the teeth. Um, and I grouped in this, the gonad, because um, I didn't know where to put it. Um, so fish parts have been used in a variety of different ways to construct weapons. Um, there's a, just a large number of it. Here I've just shown one example of a shark toothed club used by various Polynesian cultures, but mainly by native Hawaiians. Uh, this weapon uh, resembles kind of a, a ping pong paddle and it's inset with shark teeth that are placed in the grooves and sewn into place. It looks pretty deadly to me. Um, so, you know, teeth have, uh, teeth have been used in a variety of ways for weapons. Uh, tongues have also been used. Um, Arapaima, uh, this is a very large primitive fish that occurs um, in South America. Um, they're called uh, bony tongued fishes. They crush their prey with a really large tongue and their tongue uh, shown right here um, is uh, studded with teeth. So many small uh, villages um, in the Amazon use these dried uh, arapaima tongues as graters um, to break down um, different types of roots to produce cassava uh, flour. That's a, a major staple food in the developing world. Um, you know, obviously the, another classic example is the teeth of piranha, which have been used as scissors to cut things up in many parts of the world. So this is just one of a few examples of the way in which um, a teeth and tongue have been used. Um, some examples of how the gonad has been used has been really interesting. So there's some recent work that's shown that salmon milt, so that's semen from males, ca can act as an absorbent uh, to recycle rare earth elements. Um, so what's really interesting is that, um, you know, solvent extraction is, is a very difficult process. It has long been um, used to recover these rare elements um, from ore waste, but it's a very expensive process and it, um, it involves using like toxic and sometimes radioactive chemicals that are released to the environment. It's not very, not very good. So a, a, a team of Japanese students very recently just published a study d demonstrating that dried salmon semen milt um, can be used um, as a viable replacement and it was very effective in extracting these expensive elements um, from iron ore. Um, so people are looking on ways to basically partner with a vast uh, fishing industry um, to try to bring this to market. All right, so we have dissected, unfortunately, uh, the fish into a whole bunch of different parts. 
but the reality is that the whole fish can be used as a whole, in, a, in a variety of ways as well. So let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about some of these. Uh, one of the most interesting historical one uh, examples are using whole fish as a light source. Uh, many of you have probably heard of, of, of this uh, pelagic fish. It's a common name, it's called the candle fish. Um, again, like um, ratfish, they have a very high fat content, particularly during spawning time. So during spawning time, they would be collected, dried, and then any one time uh, could just set on fire and you can burn it um, as a light source. Another example of using whole fish are in the beauty spa industry. Um, so Gara Rufa, it's a, it's a marine, uh, it's a, a small bodied fish. It's also called um, the doctor fish or nibble fish. It's been used in beauty spas around the world. The fish nibble on dead fish uh, skin cells um, and they enhance skin condition um, through those actions. So you go into those beauty spas um, somewhere where I've not been, but where there's a big pool, um, you put your feet in, right? There's thousands of them and they all come and nibble your skin for a set amount of time. Um, there's also been a, a whole variety of, of chemical compounds that have been extracted for fish that are used as um, medical remedies. Um, so some have uh, demonstrated utility in like biochemical research or actually led to the development of anti-cancer and antiviral drugs. Um, so um, one example is uh, the slime from Atlantic hagfish. So uh, Atlantic hagfish, a marine species, um, as a chemical defense against its predators, um, it produces massive amounts of slime around its body. Um, and here it is pictured right here. Um, but this um, hydrogel um, also has ultra absorbent polymers that hold and retain huge amounts of water. And these properties make it really potentially useful for drug delivery, um, also tissue engineering and regeneration, as well as absorbable um, uh, sutures. Um, so uh, slime from hagfish are being used in a variety of medical ways. And then the final example I wanna use is an historical one, and that's the use of European bitterling, um, which is a small freshwater fish shown right there as a pregnancy test. Um, this was investigated back in the 1930s. Um, this fish uh, has an ovipositioner, um, which was an organ, a part of its species that it enlarges or elongates when the animal is exposed to urine from a pregnant woman, apparently. Um, so um, this fish could be used to test whether or not a, a woman was pregnant or not. Um, the, the problem is, is that this test is, was highly unreliable. Um, I don't know if it was actually ever shown to actually really work, but anyways, it was used um, for, for many years in the 1930s and, and even into the 1940s. So, um, you know, beyond all of those, you know, fish are revered in a whole variety of ways and whole fish are dried and used um, as kind of souvenirs and even attractions. So we've all seen stuffed fish on the wall of different bars or restaurants. Um, dry, unfortunately, you know, seahorses which are dried up and used as souvenirs or, or dried uh, piranha right there or my colleague right here, the big stuffed aravipa. You know, these are all kind of used in a whole variety of ways and again are non-food uses. We also revere them in a number of ways. Um, these are some photographs of one of my trips to um, Australia and some photos that people sent me through the time, just the sheer way in which we uh, revere uh, fish in many parts of the world. And I could show you similar photos from around the US where we do um, similar things. Very large fish and celebrated in a whole variety of ways. So human societies around the globe have kind of really long recognized the vital role of marine and freshwater fish in supporting really important commercial and recreational fisheries. And here I have demonstrated that there's more to fish than just food. We've reviewed the kind of the vast ways in which human society uh, gathers a multitude of other benefits from fish, far ranging from manufacturing and industry to technology, to healthcare, to weapons, apparel, jewelry, et cetera. And these diverse values of fish are not merely stories from the past, but they continue today. I've given you some examples about how fish have inspired new and innovative ways 
of, um, of uh, dealing with uh, kind of medical issues or even into manufacturing. And they continue to be explored, which provides incredible opportunities for fish to contribute to society moving forward. So when we think of fish, we often think of this definition from the Oxford Dictionary. An animal that lives in water is covered by scales and breathes by taking water in through its mouth or the flesh of these animals eaten as food. I would say this is an unfortunate definition of a fish and is very narrow-minded with respect to the diverse ways in which fish are contributing to human societies. At the core of it, a definition that would be better to look at is the intrinsic value in which fish have. Intrinsic, belonging to the thing itself, by its very nature and inherent, essential, the potential usefulness for human beings. And that is what um, I hope that we all celebrate when we think about fish moving forward. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions and hopefully attempt to answer some of your questions on the way in which fish are getting used throughout the world. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much, oh, Julian. That was awesome. Um, there are some of those I had heard of before and a whole bunch that uh, sort of spook me. Um, the whole uh, <laughs> test is definitely a, a new one to me and sounds hmm. uh, very interesting. Uh, we will give Julian a short break so he can sip his beer um, without trying to talk at the same time while we give away a few prizes. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before, so we give away um, Think and Drink swag so that you can sport this whenever you can safely get, uh, well, you can do it from a distance, actually, if people can see your socks. Um, so uh, these are the Grit City Think and Drink socks um, that we're giving away at the moment. Uh, we have, uh, these are unisex size, which basically means they're in men's sizes. Sorry, that's the way it goes. Um, they come in either small slash medium or they come in large. Uh, so when you, if you win, uh, you will chat to me since nobody else can see it. You will chat to me your mailing address and I will send you a pair of socks um, courtesy of uh, the Think and Drink tonight. Uh, but you need to let me know also besides your mailing address, let me know uh, what size you would like. So. Uh, to give away these prizes, I come up with random things uh, to ask you, um, and then you will, so get your chat ready, so you will actually stick a number into the chat when I ask you, and the first person that comes, gets the answer correct, uh, or gets close enough, uh, we're going to give these away. So we have two pairs to give away tonight. So the first one, because I am visiting, uh, staying in the uh, house of my brother and sister-in-law, both of which are doctors, the first uh, question for you tonight is, how many bones in the adult human body? How many bones in the adult human body? Oh, we got 208, a 56, a 208, 821. That's if you're broken a lot. 150, anybody else? Remember, guessing is free, 206. Well, my answer that I have, and this came from two doctors, was 206. So the first person to actually guess that was Bruce Chambers. So Bruce, congratulations, you win a pair of socks. I know that several of you might have other answers because it turns out there is no one official answer to this question. And it depends on whether you're younger or older and whether you have odd, thing, odd, odd extra bones. So uh, we're going with the official uh, Googled answer by two doctors in Michigan. So that makes it all official. Um, so Bruce, send me your info. Second question, get ready. So this is in uh, honor of our speaker tonight. It's a Canadian question. So our question is how many, wait for it, how many territories are there in Canada? Oh, Not stop, provinces. Stop, Jim, stop. <laughs> I sure hope people get this very quickly. Got a seven, a four, Ooh. a three. The answer is three. So mm. Brianna Fitzgerald nails it first. She gets the other pair of socks. So Brianna, congratulations again. Send me your info and what size you want. Congratulations to our winners. And if you didn't win tonight, remember you can always come back next month check out Jenny J's talk and you get a chance to win more socks. Now, we do cycle through. So uh, 
you can get collector's items. So I, uh, we gave away shirts first and then it was hats, which I had on, but then you can't see my face in here. Um, and now it's socks. So eventually it will be a underwear or imprinted fish materials that I think uh, will be um, come from some ideas from Julian soon. So we'll come up with um, some cool shirts made from fish skin, uh, which may take a little bit of doing. <laughs> so, uh, so we have some t questions to start off with. So if you have your questions, chat them in there and I will pass them on to Julian. Brianna asked earlier, so did the NASA, did NASA ever use the ratfish? And uh, if not, how many other, what are the most interesting older uses of fish that still are happening today? Oh, wow. Yeah, so NASA didn't, and by my understanding, NASA did not, but I, I was pretty sure that they were using an oil from, uh, from some other animal. It could have even been whale based or something like that. I think they were using a uh, blubber from whales um, in the end. Um, so fish didn't make the cut, but it was part of it. Um, the second part, what are some really cool uses of fish that are still getting used? Um, well, yeah, I guess, I guess one which is really interesting is that um, fish, uh, basically fish juice, if you will, has been kind of used as a long, long source for kind of a bio-friendly uh, deterrent um, to wildlife. Um, so this idea that um, particularly if you're around your house or farm and stuff like that, where you're trying to keep small rodents away um, from certain structures and stuff like that, more and more you can get kind of synthetic pheromones that are kind of, are, you know, smelt chemicals that are in there. Um, but actual fish juice is still in those kind of biodegradable um, uh, solutions that you can use, which you still can buy in shops around the place here. So it's still used now and it's been used for uh, centuries. That's interesting. I wonder what it is in fish juice that makes it repellent to rodents. That's pretty yeah. wild. Um, there was actually just a comment about uh, the fish nibbling uh, pedicure thing that goes on. Uh, I remember seeing these and found out that we cannot uh, do this in this country because uh, the, F uh, the FDA won't approve of it, I guess. Yeah, and, uh, and to follow up also as a side note, um, they're also a prohibited species. They're invasive species in the area. So about five years ago, a spa down in Renton um, had them, but unfortunately they were confiscated. Um, after they found out about them. Yep. Gotcha. Uh, another question, uh, what is the most used fish? So for you, pure utility, what is it? Oh my, um, what is the most used fish? Um, I would, well, probably stuff that I did not well, I don't know, are we counting kind of uh, fish protein and stuff like that? You can um, but, do it however you want, it's your yeah. answer. Yeah, it's my answer. I don't, ah, uh, shoot. Um, what is the most, in terms of the stuff that I talked about today, um, I don't know, it probably have to do with the use of fish scales and cosmetics. Potentially, I would think. Um, but really, if it's not that, it's going to be things like things that are used in like fish meal. For example, small pelagic fish sardines as a great example is one of the most used fish. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, you actually mentioned the, the um, different cosmetics. I remember in the Amazon, they have a quite ancient fish called the, they call it piruruku there. I'm not sure what other names it goes by, but the scales are about this big. Yes. Uh, and they you sell them for nail files and other things. That's right. Yep. That's the same fish as uh, arapaima, uh, uh, right, with the, uh, the, the long tongue, uh, studded uh, tongue. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Let's see. So uh, another use brought up by Russ um, is that uh, it can be romantic. Fish can be romantic. So he brings up that the Grunion Run uh, is supposedly a date night on the beach, uh, I believe. So um, I don't know if you wanted to add that to your list. Awesome. Uh, Actually, yeah. Is it true, uh, Mary asked, is it true that WD-40 is made with fish oils? Wow. I 
don't know. Someone, someone can probably Google it while we're talking and answer that for me. That would be cool. I don't know. Um, definitely fish oil, again, has been used as a lubricant in very similar things, particularly in sprays for small like clocks um, and stuff like that. So I wouldn't be surprised if historically it was used in WD-40, uh, but someone let me know by the end of this. Uh, Eric says that anglers spray WD-40 on lures when fishing for salmon. So uh, I don't know yes. if that makes it have some sort of fish base to it. Well, I, historically that fish oil was used on, on you know, reels and rods and stuff like that, yep. Uh, some other people are saying yes, so I don't know. Uh, we'll awesome. see if it's an old, old wives' tale or not. Um, uh, Ahmed asks, is the sea running out of fish and should we be concerned? Yep, great question. So, um, you know, obviously, particularly in this region, there's been a lot of work, you know, in terms of investigating kind of sustainability of our wild caught fisheries. Um, a lot of doom and gloom that's out there. But I think what's remarkable is that, you know, when you look at the science, the vast majority of fisheries are sustainably managed around the world. Um, so wild caught fisheries in many parts of the world are doing very well, there's exceptions. Um, but the reality is that we are increasingly dependent upon aquaculture uh, to raise fish in many, many places. Um, so from that first graph, you'll see that that proportion of fish are that associated with wild uh, with aquacultures increasing through time and stuff like that. Um, so definitely exceptions, but I think the picture is rosy with respect to how a lot of our fisheries are managed now for maximal yield. Cool. Uh, another question from Brianna, what is your personal opinion on how we can keep up the biodiversity of fish and keep, sa keep them safe while still enjoying them? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, what, one of the first things that we can do is recognize these diverse values. I think that's really key, you know, and the, and the large things that I didn't talk about here, which I study a lot of is just the value of fish in terms of healthy functioning ecosystems. Um, and, you know, so, you know, what we can do is a lot of the things that we're attempting to do here in the Pacific Northwest is that is create functioning habitats and landscapes which support fisheries. So whether or not that's thinking about uh, how we manage our dams and small barrier, uh, barrier removers, removal, you know, how we think about restoring our local wetlands and streams, all of these small things basically amass into kind of good benefits with respect to uh, fish in the region. I, one person, uh, I, somebody brought this up a while back, but um, how much of a play, uh, how much do fish play in controlling insect populations? So things like mosquitoes or other midges, things that we hate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of fish do do that. And they serve a really important role. Mosquito fish have traditionally been introduced to many different parts of the world to consume uh, mosquitoes reduce, you know, rates of malaria, as an example, or other mosquito borne diseases. Um, so yeah, fish. Lots of fish do a lot of really cool functions, which we don't actually keep track of that well. Um, so often people will think about, oh, you know, a large majority of small body fish, they're not important. We can't eat them and I can't catch them on the end of a hook, but they're doing a whole variety of what we call ecosystem services that are really important. And one of which is exactly that is eating nuisance um, uh, insect species. Right. Yeah. Uh, Russ asks, can you recommend any cool new books to read about fish or the ocean in general? Oh, he, there's, there's a bent towards ocean right there. So I know, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I can, uh, maybe I'll put some in the chat. I'll put some in the chat so that people can see them. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, what is your person? Oh, we got that one. Any other questions, folks? I think I might have gotten the last one. I see a nice thing in the chat about uh, lamprey, lamprey fins uh, being used to soothe the pain of teething babies. Oh, I missed that one. Um, that was a direct message to me. That was kind of cool. Yeah, I didn't know that one. Uh, lamprey oil has been traditionally used as a gel for hair, uh, especially for native peoples. Um, but I didn't know that about fins. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Very cool. All right. Uh, well, Julian's going to add a few things. So let's give our speaker one last big a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much for uh, being with us tonight, Julian. Appreciate it. Very cool no talk.
Um, for those of you who won, I saw, I think Bruce's stuff already up there, but make sure Brianna that you get your info in the chat before I close it down so that I can get your prize to you. Uh, Julian's put some info, how to think like a fish. Uh, that's a cool talk. Uh, that's a good title. I wish I would have thought of that one. Um, so uh, make sure that you check that stuff out. And again, uh, remember every second Tuesday, you can mark it on your calendar. And once we are able to get back in person, uh, we will uh, be back at some local pub in the Tacoma region. But I appreciate uh, the ability to actually have more people from around uh, the place to actually check these out while we're virtual. And we may try to do that uh, um, more um, even when we go back live. So uh, hopefully everybody's staying healthy. I'm glad to see everybody here tonight. Um, and with that, I will let you go so that you can enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you all for being here. And thanks to Julian again for an awesome talk. Thanks, everyone. Bye, folks.